Hello there. Welcome back. You're listening to Linda Pinizzato of the Condo Expert. So here you go. We've touched on different diversities of, of taking investments, uh, you know, money from your own property, investing it, diverting it into other solutions, gaining not paying 2.6% on interest, but gaining back up to 8%. I mean, think about all that. If you weren't listening to this show, you wouldn't know anything about it. So I'll tell you what, what about seniors? You know, I'm today I'm talking to Conrad Kopass. Uh, he's an investment advisor with Chippingham Financial Group. And, you know, Conrad, like especially in condominiums, you know, we talk quite a bit to seniors because, you know, they have their investment money. Some of them are having difficulties in their condos now. Some of them aren't. Some are thinking about whether or not they want to pull monies out down the road, maybe go into long-term care. I mean, these are this is reality. It's the hard course of life, I guess. So I know you have the RRIF program. Maybe you can, you know, give a little bit of an insight into that because I don't know whether seniors really have an in-depth explanation of how that whole thing works. Well, when you contribute to RSPs when during your working life, at age 71, you actually have to convert it into a RIF account. Oh, so you're, the government actually forces you they to. They force you they to. For, at 71? Yeah, the age of 71. Really? Is that like right on your birth date? You have to have this done? In the year of your birth date. In the year of your birth date. Okay, That's right. gotcha. So they'll force you to convert it. And the reason why is now... You have to you have to actually pull money out legally a minimum amount, and now the the whole point of RSPs and RIF really is RSPs. You're getting deductions during a time where you're making the most money, and the RIF is designed that when you're pulling money out, that you're in maybe a lower tax bracket. You're not making as much money. That's not necessarily the case for a lot of people, but they're pulling money out and they're getting taxed at whatever tax rate they are at at that point. So a RIF account, with large RIF accounts, you really have to be careful because how you set it up before it becomes a RIF account is that if too much money is getting paid out, that can now affect your CPP and OAS. So they could start clawing back on your old age security if you start making too much money. And when you say too much money, like are we talking $100,000 of an RRSP or we're talking about the money that you're pulling out? I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not quite... Well, it's not the money that you make within the account. It's how much right. you're pulling out. So if your minimum payment is $60,000, it's going to start clawing in a little bit. I think it's up to like one twenty, one thirty, where... It'll take all of your old age security away. So you have to be able to know how you structure it before you get in. Before you're 71. That's so, right. So I don't know. Like, I mean, what if somebody decides that they're retiring at 68? I mean, and they, they don't have any it. income at all. Would they want to convert or do they want to just pull all their money out of RSPs and put it into some other vehicle? That is tough because it's you really have to look at a one-for-one one basis on something like that. They can start pulling money out, but more strategically, I guess. So we look at how much money they have in uh, cash, you know, like uh, outside of our registered account, and how much they have in registered accounts. So if they're going to retire early, we always say that you want to pull it out of the registered account before you touch the cash amount. Because when you have your regular cash, you can control how much you get paid, how much capital gains you trigger. But with a RIF, you don't have that control. The government tells you this is the minimum. When it comes to retirement planning, you kind of want to start looking at what beforehand, maybe five years beforehand, what you really want to do with your RSP money. Maybe you want to start pulling it now. You might retire at 65, but you might not want to convert it to a RIF yet at 71. Maybe you want to start pulling it now. Hold back on your old age security, you know, a couple of years because you have those capabilities of either taking things early, like CPP, you could take it a bit early or you could postpone it, right? And if you postpone it, you can actually get a bigger credit that gets paid to you on a monthly basis. Oh, I see. Okay, so now... 
I guess over and above, if somebody is, say for instance, what if someone's a police officer or maybe they've worked in the educational system, so they've been a government employee, and say they're over 25 years, they've already got some kind of employee benefit, mm -hmm. so they will get, I don't know, 90% of their income once they retire. How does that affect everything? Because, I mean, if they're in that kind of a situation, then they have their RRSPs, they have these restrictions on them, it seems like they may be losing some money in the whole, you know, combination of it by the time they're turning 71. It, it seems mm -hmm. almost as if it may defeat the purpose of having some RRSPs. Well, funny enough. If they've already got that yeah. guarantee of We income. actually have a lot of teachers and, and police officers as clients. Mm -hmm. So I would say count themselves as lucky that they actually have a pension that's going to look out for them. It's obviously tougher on teachers that are starting now because a lot more of their income is going towards their pension. But teachers that, you know, have already been in their 20 years, 25 years, what's happening is, is as that pension is being created, their RSP room is being taken out anyway. So most times they're not actually contributing to RSPs anyway. It's because their pension is already eating up in that. Oh, I see. Okay, because they're paying their monthly dues. Oh, that's right. That's okay. right. So it's being deducted from their RSP room. So in that circumstance, what we find is, for example, a lot of police officers that, that we know, they take their payout and then we invest it properly for them. Because just like any, I know it's a government-run pension, but any pension, like if you look at OMERS, and hoops, like uh, we were de dealing with a nurse for hoops. Even though Hoop made a lot of money, they're still underfunded. Their pension obligations, they're underfunded for what they have to pay out in the future. So even though like an Air Canada employee thought they were so safe, but ask those people that had to adjust their pensions when Air Canada restructured. So you really have to sometimes take it into your own Mm -hmm. uh, hands to make sure that your money's safe, but people that have defined benefit plans, which is where the institution that they're dealing with is matching them and saying that they're going to have X amount when they retire, is still much better situation than a lot of Canadians, because a lot of Canadians have to worry about their own retirement. 50% of them are going to retirement with a mortgage on their primary residence. You know, I'm glad you've brought that into the forefront because, you know, I think like being self-employed, I mean, I'm self-employed mm -hmm. and you're self-employed to a degree, you know, because of the way, I guess, as an investment advisor, you must have that kind of a structure in there. I know mortgage officers have that as well. So there's an awful lot of people out there that aren't in that corporate umbrella or governmental umbrella that would have that. So they have to look beyond it, which then brings into play investment opportunities as far as investment properties, right? So if you're, if you're putting your monies into investment properties and you are getting yourself a tenant, because, you know, nowadays they're not even building very many uh, rental apartment buildings anymore. Nowadays they're all condominiums. And people are more into owning another second property, whether or not they have it for themselves, looking at retirement whether or not they're bringing it into the picture because they want to help their children down the way. Mm -hmm. But you mentioned earlier, and we'll, we'll talk a bit more on that one, is, is that there was other ways to pull monies out on your investment properties and to use that towards the mutual fund directives and so on. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, with respect to the difference of the interest rates. Well, I mean, when it comes to the rental properties... Because we touched on that a bit. <laughs> a little bit. A, <laughs> a little bit. bit. We just needed to get some clarity. No problem. Right. So, like, my family's been dealing with rental properties for a long time. Mm -hmm. I have my own rental properties as well. And right now, there's a bit of a discrepancy on what people can get for rent versus what they're paying for, right? Especially in the GTA. So... Right now, what I'm seeing is about a cap rate of 6% possibly on the purchase price of the property and the uh, gross income that someone's getting on a, from a rental. And, I mean, I've, I grew up with this golden rule that it has to be 10%, but uh, that's long gone for the last five to, to eight years possibly. But when it comes to rental properties, it's, I still think it's a great idea. It's just, I guess, not having all your eggs in one basket. And especially when you think of seniors, 
if you have extra money and then you buy yourself a rental property, make sure that you're aware that you're going to have to put some time in it or you're going to have to hire a property management company to do all that work for you, which will also lower your spread, right? And time is money. Well, absolutely. And you have to know, I, I don't really think, I think for seniors, it would be probably a difficult task only because unfortunately, the uh, increases of uh, rent, because they're capped through the rent review boards and so on. I mean, I think this year's increase for 2014 is 0.8%. That's it. So if somebody out there is collecting, for instance, $1,500 a month in rent, if you've gone over $1,512 per month now over this next year, then you're way beyond what you're allowed to be doing. And that's not, uh, it's not making it easy for people that own rental properties because they have those kind of restrictions on there. They have those restrictions, but also if interest rates start rising and they have a lot of debt on their mortgage, and especially anybody that has those all-inclusive rental properties with energy prices spiking, and then like the natural gas bills uh, going through the roof on my properties, you really have to be careful because if you can't raise your rent to the same degree as your expenses, it's just going to get tighter, 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 right? So mm -hmm. it's something to keep uh, conscious of. And especially if interest rates start rising, how is that going to affect the appreciation of your property, right? So... Though I believe in holding onto rental properties is great, but the strategy that I was talking about earlier in creating a tax-efficient strategy that kind of works like a rental property, but your tenants are the big corporations that are paying you rent, it will react to interest rates a little differently than your rental property. So to keep that in mind, that's why sometimes having your eggs not an all-in-one basket is very important, especially in these historic low interest rates that, to be honest, no one really knows what kind of change is going to happen and how is that going to affect everything. You could only make educated guesses based on the past. But your guesses are actually very good. <laughs> you know, Conrad, you're coming up with a topic that I've been hitting for quite some time, even on my shows, to be honest with you. I'm going to touch really quickly, and then we'll go for a break, is the condo market. Right now, in order for anyone to purchase a condo, in order to use it as a rental, they have to have minimum 20%, if not 25% down to cover. And a lot of that is based on what's happening with those maintenance fees. Because there's some buildings, although the price is down, the maintenance fee is through the roof. And all-inclusive with hydro bills and uh, energy and everything else going on in the building. Plus, as everyone knows, I created the Condo Owners Association simply because I'm believing a lot that we are in for a ride on condos with these maintenance fees because we do not have any degree of proper governance or accountability in our Condominium Act, which is provincial legislation. So having said that, we're going to go to a break. If I had to put a word out there to condo owners, get involved, join the Condo Owners Association at coaontario.com. Today we've gotten great information from Conrad Kopaz, a lot of insight into the investment world. You group it together between investments, real estate, it's all part of the same game. So hang tight, we'll be right back. It's Linda Pinizzato of the Condo Expert. Using borrowed money to finance the purchase of securities involves greater risk than using cash resources only. Potential losses could exceed the amount you invested, and you may sustain a total loss of the initial funds deposited by you plus any amount of the loan that exceed the total market value of the securities. Past or historical performance of any security is not an indicator or guarantee of future performance or returns. You should not borrow to invest if you have a low tolerance for risk. You will be dependent on the income from the investments to pay daily living expenses, or if you have no way of repaying the debt if the income from the investment declines or stops. Linda Pinizzato guarantees that you have the real estate knowledge you need to make the right decisions. Call Linda Pinizzato at Sutton Group Quantum Realty, 416-561-7373, or visit her at lindapinizzato.com Oh, my computer crashed. Oh no, I've got a virus. Oh, uh, no way, no internet connection. Do you need help? Call IT Mayday. 
647-977-7113. ITMayday.com.